as you can see, this was a video that I had originally intended to give in February, but somehow something happened then and stopped me from doing it. I can't remember what it was. It's a talk about Althusser and about time. And I'm talking about this because I'm currently working with two other people on a new book on materialism. And this stuff about randomness and time is material I originally published as an article maybe 10 years ago or so, but it relates to what's going to come out in the book on materialism. And I'm calling it Looking Back on Althusser from the 20th Century because there's a paradoxical character to the last book of Althusser's that was published in that it scarcely takes into account much of what happened in the 20th century. I'm going to have an introduction to it and then I'm going to talk about the epistemological break in this first video. Subsequent videos will look on at teleology, contingency and history. Now I'm dealing with his book Philosophy of the Encounter translated by a guy called Goshgarian and I think despite Althusser's manifest failings as a human being being a wife murderer and a depressive etc he was someone of tremendous intellectual rigour and insight and even homicidal maniacs can say things that are worth paying attention to. The book is collected from notes and unpublished letters that were put together after his death. And if the book can be said to have any underlying theme, it's what the translator calls aleatory materialism, which is a very odd word from an English speaking uh, readers point of view because aleatory is not really a proper English word it it's derived from the notion of from the Latin word for dice or a game of dice but anyone with a scientific background would translate it as randomness or stochastic since that's the terminology that the English speaking community uses for the philosophical concept that Alters is discussing. And this is just one of many cases where you get a degree of mystification brought about by translators. And it, because of this, I think it's interesting to compare Althusser's materialisme aléatoire to the work of 20th century scientists who grappled in their own fields with some of the issues that Althusser is concerned with. So there's the stochastic concept in the work of Heisenberg. There's the problem of the origins of structure in the work of Kaufmann. And there's the implicit critique of the Hegelian method provided by the failure of Hilbert and Russell's project. So I'm going to talk for a bit about the concept of the epistemological break. This was an idea that Mark, that Althusser originally raised in his book Four Marks in the 1960s. And that was a polemic against the humanist Marxism which the Eurocommunists were fond of in the 1960s. And this humanist Marxism based itself on the very early writings of Marx in the early 1840s. And Althusser 
pointed out that there's a big difference between the theory that Marx puts forward in the early 1840s and his mature work in Capital. And following Bachelard, Althusser says this is a epistemological break, something which occurs with the foundation of a new science. You get a break from the ideas that existed before. Just as with Darwin, you get a break from the deistic ideas of a great chain of being to the theory of evolution. He's saying that Marx carried out a similar break in developing capital, which was a move from humanism to historical materialism. Now, in his last work, uh, Philosophy of Encounter, Althusser says, well, actually there were some relict Hegelian idealist strands in Marx as late as Capital. And he says that the theory of commodity fetishism in um, Capital is a Feuerbachian hangover. And it's a very explicit and possibly ironic application of Feuerbach's theory of religion to the commodity. Uh, if you look at the footnotes in Capital, there are clear references to Feuerbach's theory of religion. Althusser says that the first break from idealism in Marx was towards Feuerbach, whose materialism was not yet a causal one and retained strong idealist themes, particularly in Feuerbach's theory of alienation. I think this is realistic. Um, epistemological breaks don't take place in totality straight away. But um, why do we have to rely on Lucretius? Um, Althusser refers back to Lucretius as his source for the idea of stochastic randomness or aleator aleatory aspects. I think Althusser would have been much better to rely on the modern atomists. And then when we see, look at the modern atomists, we can see that epistemological breaks are not immediately complete. If you look at the break between classical and quantum atomism, as described by Heisenberg himself, you can see it wasn't complete. Heisenberg, in Physics and Philosophy, gives an account of the historical birth of quantum theory. And he says there's a long period between Planck's, in, Planck's initial work on black body radiation, 1895, to Einstein's introduction of the idea of the photon in 1905, so Einstein is absolutely crucial to the re-establishment of atomism, both in his work on the, the photoelectric effect and on his work on Brownian motion. And then it goes on to the matrix and wave mechanics of Heisenberg and Schrödinger, up to the synthesis of these in the late 1920s by von Neumann. So we're talking about a 30-year period here. Uh, for the epistemological break between classical and quantum mechanics. And during this period, you have half a dozen or so of the brightest minds in the world at work on it. And they're working collectively. And in the early 20s, they had hybrid ideas. So you have the, the sort of Bohr atom, which is, is a sort of model of the planetary system, which mixes a bit of quantum with a bit of the classical continuum. Unlike the case of quantum mechanics in the 20th century, there are only two bright guys developing historical material in the 19th century. So to demand a complete break is far too much. And then look at the evolutionary theory. You can see the same thing in Darwin. Darwin's working alone. Well, let's assi leave aside Russell, who he didn't really collaborate with. The, there's an explicit break with the Lamarckian concept of the evolution of acquired characteristics in the origin of the species. But if you read through The Descent of Man or The Expression of the Emotions, you find 
individual passages and sections where you can see even Darwin is still thinking in terms of Lamarckian acquired characteristics. And why is that? It's because if you don't have a theory of genetics, which wasn't developed till Mendel, the old idea of evolution through acquired characteristics retains its appeal. And one of my co-authors has just been rereading the transition from ape to man by Engels, and he's, he points out that's full of Lamarckian uh, arguments. That it, it doesn't actually have a Darwinian argument. And we now relate to Darwin through Dawkins. And Dawkins' demonstration of the logical inconsistency of the Lamarckian model is easy to see after we know about DNA, but it wasn't originally so evident. So epistemological breaks, even those as important as quantum physics and evolutionary theory, don't take place completely. They have hangovers. One of the key points that Althusser goes on about from the 1960s to his very last works is the rejection of Hegelian themes in Marx. So what he's saying in his last book is that Marx hadn't completely broken from Hegelian idealism, even when writing Capital. And it retains a number of Feuerbachian themes, Hegelian themes, and an underground materialist or Epicurean, that is to say, atomist theme. And I think uh, Capital also contains strong themes from Archimedes, Newton and Watt as well, which can be viewed as the continuation of the Epicurean theme. And the, the poverty of the Hegelian presumption is recently summarised by Chaitin, who says you can't get two kilos of theorems from one kilo of axioms. New content requires new information, and new information, if Shannon's right, is just random, and hence in Althusser's term, aléatoire. One of the things Althusser is asking what is why did Marx structure capital in what appears to be a Hegelian way, a progression from the abstract to the concrete, starting with the commodity, then exchange value, then value, then surplus value. His argument is that this is essentially an ideal derivation. And he contrasts this Hegelian mode to the concrete historical accounts in other parts of capital. The section on primitive accumulation and the section on the working day. Or it could be said the section on the transition from machinery to uh, sorry, handicraft to modern industry. Those all bring in concrete historical information. They don't attempt to deduce things. And he says the actual generation of capitalism has to be recognised as something contingent, something produced by an actual material history. We ha have the same, sort of, he says, capitalists influenced by Hegel's logic in terms of the presentation process, the deduction from being to no nothingness and becoming from the, from the contradiction of the two, for example, in the logic. And at the beginning, there's a certain plausibility to this, but by the time you get to ought, the derivation of ought, it's a conjuring trip. It sneaks in already preformed uh, presuppositions and concepts which it can't derive. And it, it relies for what plausibility it has on shared linguistic presuppositions between the writer and the reader. What Althusser says is Marx essentially does the same thing. It only works by sneaking in real historical forms with their own history and information content, like commodities and money. And if we look at the history of mathematics, 
and if any uh, domain should be suitable to the logical self-development of the idea, it's maths. We can see how a method analogous to that of Hegel came to grief. Okay, the, there was the formless project of the early late 19th, early 20th century of, of Russell and Hilbert. First place it comes to grief is in set theory, when Russell finds he's got the paradox of the class of all classes that are not members of themselves in his principles of mathematics. How do you define that? Is it a member of itself or not? Uh, the, he gets around that with a fix about type theory. But more generally, the, the formless project is destroyed by Turing in his paper on the decision problem. The project aimed to found mathematics on logic, and Hilbert had asked if there was a mechanical procedure by which the truth or falsity of a mathematical theorem could be determined. And if a theorem could be proven true, then you can demonstrate that it can be derived from the axioms using valid rules of inference. In that sense, it's a mechanical proof. So if you could discover a mechanical method for checking arbitrary theorems, you'd have demonstrated that all maths could be logically deduced from a collection of founding axioms, which appeared plausible in the early 20th century. Turing proved that no such uh, decision process can exist. He took the term mechanical literally. He designed a mechanical universal computer that could do any calculation that a mathematician could perform. And he shows that the assumption of such mechanical proof capacity leads to a contradiction analogous to Russell's paradox. And it thus follows, even in mathematics, that the project of a complete logical development from axioms falls down. And you can't get more out of an axiomatic system than you put in. That's basically Chaitin's um, conclusion from Turing's work. Stuff on teleology.